Well, hello and blessings to all. For those of you who have not been with us, my name is Tim Gold, Minister of Education Administration at First Baptist here in Pell City. Welcome to this week's online lesson in the Explore the Bible Curriculum series. We'll continue our study in the book of Isaiah. Now, last week, we learned that God hears the prayers of his people. Today, we're going to be looking at Isaiah 40, which teaches us that God provides strength for those who trust in him. And this week's lesson is entitled, God Renews. Some initial thoughts on our lesson today. Uh, people like being compared to someone who is well respected in their given field. For example, a person who plays a sport usually appreciates being compared to an accomplished player in that sport. However, no one likes being compared to someone or something beneath him or her. Isaiah understood this truth and proclaimed that because everything is beneath God, nothing compares to him. God alone is worthy of worship and trust, and the one who trusts in the Lord will not be disappointed. Some questions to consider as we start today. Who is someone you've been compared to? How can a comparison be flattering? How can a comparison lead to trouble? Good questions to consider. Well, let's look at the context of our lesson today in Isaiah 40, uh, verse 1 through four, chapter 41, verse 29. Well, there are several differences between chapters 40 through 66 and chapters 1 through 39 of Isaiah. Chapters 1 through 39 focuses on God's judgment on Israel, Judah, and the nations. Excuse me. Assyria is both the dominant power and God's instrument of judgment in these chapters. Eventually, though, Assyria received judgment for its own sins. Chapters 40 through 66, by contrast, focus on the return from Babylon, the land of Judah's exile. These chapters are full of hope and the promise of redemption, and the language in these chapters reflects that different tone. Because of the change in tone and the fact that chapters 40 through 66 predict future events that were to unfold after Isaiah's lifetime, some scholars have speculated that someone other than the prophet Isaiah wrote these chapters. But when all the evidence is weighed and measured, however, the only reason to reject the idea that Isaiah was the writer is an anti-supernatural bias, which some scholars have. For those of us who believe God, knows the future and revealed this information to his prophets for his purposes, there is every reason to believe that Isaiah was the writer of the entire book that bears his name. Now, chapters 40 through 41 relate to a sort of do-over for the people of God. The penalty for their sins had been paid, and they had a chance to start anew. Chapter 40 explains that the exile the Israelites and Judeans experienced was, in fact, a testimony to God's ability to accomplish what he said he would do. Well, for most of the cultures in the ancient Near East, destruction and exile would be reason to doubt the power of the gods. By contrast, chapter 40 relates that the destruction of Jerusalem and the exile of the people demonstrate just the direct opposite. God had predicted these things would happen and that the exile would last for 70 years. The fact that these events had come to pass was a testimonial to God's character and power to accomplish his word. Well, chapter 41 explains how the future deliverance of, of Isaiah's audience would play out. Not only would God's people be redeemed from captivity, there would also be opportunities for all nations to come to a redeeming knowledge of God. This would be part of the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Chapter 41 also makes it clear that God would work through the existing institutions of the world to accomplish his task. While we tend to look for God to work in miraculous ways, the truth is that more often than not, God works through normal events in history. For Isaiah, the idea that God would orchestrate history was even more astounding than an overt miracle. It demonstrated that God was in control of everything and everyone. He didn't need to break into the seemingly ordinary to accomplish his word and will. Finally, Chapter 41 also introduces a concept that will reoccur several times in the remainder of the book. This concept is that of the servant of the Lord. The idea of the servant was not a static one. Initially, however, Israel was the servant who would accomplish God's will. In the immediate context, the servant Israel's captivity proves God is in control and idols can do nothing. In the same way, 
that discipline demonstrates a parent's love for a child, so too do the exile demonstrates God's love and control. So, that sets the context. Let's get into our scripture for today. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 18 through 20. Verse 18. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? Well, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 18 through 31 serves as the conclusion to verses 1 through 17. In the first half of the chapter, the prophet spoke of the future hope for the people living in Babylonian exile. This hope was anchored in God's incomparable power. Rather than, the, rather than the exile being a sign of God's weakness, it was a sign of his control over the world. This may be why Isaiah uses the word El here instead of the more typical Elohim. Both words are translated into English with the word God when they refer to the Lord. However, the word El was also used the name for the chief Canaanite God. Thus, by using this particular name, Isaiah was indicating that, that Israel's God is the true God. When we combine the, this idea with the previous and following verses that tell how the Lord is the only real God, it's clear that God is incomparable. The Lord is the one and only God. There is no other. We cannot help but wonder if Isaiah had the vision of God enthroned with angels around him, as you refer back to chapter 6, if he didn't have this in mind when he wrote these verses. With an unmistakable sarcasm, Isaiah liked, Isaiah asked, but rather, or what likeness compare with him? The word translated as likeness takes the reader back to the creation of humanity. Adam and Eve were created in likeness and the image of God himself. Yet, here men were tempted to make a likeness of a God. The in the inverted nature of this action is the reason for the prophet's sarcasm. Why would mankind worship something that he himself has made? How can such a thing be greater than him in any way? Furthermore, why wouldn't people worship the one who created them? Good questions to consider. Verses 19 through 20. An idol, a craftsman cast it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and cast it, cast it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. All right, choosing to worship an idol is completely foolish since the people control the process of making the image from beginning to end. In addition, it's readily apparent that the created idol has no power at all. It has to be made. It doesn't move. It doesn't speak. It doesn't eat. It definitely didn't put the people of God into exile, and it will not be the one to bring them out of exile. Well, just in point, the case was not clear enough. Just in, just in case the point was not clear enough, excuse me. Isaiah described the process of making an idol. First, it had to be cast. A mold was crafted by a skilled artisan and some sort of relatively inexpensive metal was used to create the form of the God's image. There was nothing special about this metal, nothing that set it apart from items used in daily life. The same metal could have been used to make a tool, a weapon, or money. Next, the image was covered in a precious metal such as gold and decorated with silver chains. While this decoration set the object apart from everyday items, the idol remained an object that was little more than jewelry or art in reality. Finally, some sort of sturdy wood was contributed for the base. Uh, this base needed to be strong enough that it would not rot and sturdy enough that the idol would not fall over. The story of the image of the Philistine god Dagon falling over in the, his temple would have no, no doubt sprung to the mind of Isaiah's readers. You see that in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, for a little history on that, that backstory. Now, how can anyone worship something that has to be stabilized by its owner? The very thing that makes idols so attractive to humanity is also their weakness. They can be controlled. God, on the other hand, cannot be controlled. God is the one who controls. If his people doubted this to be true, Isaiah noted that they only needed to look at God's control of the events in history or of history and compare that to the manufacturing process of making an idol. Some questions to consider at this time. 
Do you ever find yourself wishing that you can you could control the outcome of events or bargain with God to get what you wanted? Hmm. Are there idols that you have created to give you a sense of control? How does knowing that God is the only true God help you overcome that temptation? Really good questions to consider at our lesson point this time. All right, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 21 through 26. Verse 21, do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Well, continuing the pattern of rhetorical questions, questions seen in verse 18, Isaiah asked if God's people were ignorant of God's nature. Do you not know? Do you not hear? By virtue of being God's people, they would have heard time and time again stories about God, His character, and His covenant with them. Israel's very existence as a people was tied to God's activity from the beginning. There is likely a reference to Isaiah 6 here. From the time of his calling to be a prophet, Isaiah knew his message would cause the people to become more resistant to God's message. God told the prophet that his words would actually dull their ability to hear and cloud their ability to understand. You see that in chapter 6, verse 9. Yet the people were without excuse. When they were tempted to make idols, they were reminded that the only true God has existed forever, long before materials used to make idols came into existence. After all, God created the foundations of the earth itself. All one needs to do is to consider the ground one stands upon to realize how utterly powerful God is. The Creator was before the foundations of the earth. He created those foundations. Verse 22 through 24. It is He who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. Well, Isaiah emphasized that the Lord sits above the circle of the earth. God is above and separate from his creation. It is somewhat difficult to know what is meant by a circle of the earth. Most likely, this phrase refers to the way people of Isaiah's time understood the universe. It was a picture of the sun moving across the sky in an arc from horizon to horizon each day, and the stars doing the same at night. The phrasing once, bring, once again brings us back into focus the image from chapter 6, God on his throne in his heavenly throne room. Now, in contrast to God's power and size, the people of earth are like grasshoppers. Isaiah used this image to show how people must appear to the creator of the world. How can humans, how can humanity think they can control God? Isaiah went on to describe God's relationship with the world he created. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. The universe is akin to a tool in God's hands. While this imagery speaks to us of the power and majesty of God, it said much about it said much more to Isaiah's audience. See, the pagan religions of the ancient Near East describe the gods making the heavens from their own bodies. In some Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian stories, one god defeats another and crafts the heavens and earth from the dead god's corpse. Most people then believe that creation was made from the same divine substance as their gods. As a result, the gods were tied to the world they operated and were affected by it. Not so with Israel's God. He was wholly apart from what he had made. Since God is creator of all, he is the one who brings princes to nothing. Quite literally, God would make them not be. Isaiah was not speaking of a removal from power so much as a removal from existence. God would unmake the rulers. Well, the parallel thought to this idea is that rulers of the earth would be made as emptiness. 
The term translated emptiness is tohu, one of the pair of Hebrew words typically tr translated as formless and void. This phrasing would have immediately taken Isaiah's audience back to Genesis 1-2. The initial state of creation was formless and void, but God sets things in order as He created. As Creator, God can make the le leaders and institutions of the world, and He can unmake them. The leaders of the earth have no power unless God gives it to them. Again, Isaiah reasserted that God is in charge, even though it may seem like human leaders are calling the shots. Something good to remember during this uh, season of our country. In fact, these same earthly leaders are like plants that only last a season. Isaiah used a similar analogy to the one he used for all of humanity in chapter 40, verse 6. Most vegetation on earth only lasts a season before it withers and flies away as dried stubble in the wind. Even as people are like grass or grasshoppers when compared to God, earthly leaders are like vegetation that sprouts up and then dies. In comparison to God, the seemingly huge impact of a human leader is a very small thing. Furthermore, Isaiah declared that God is the source of the leader's demise. It is God who blows on them and they wither. The rise and the fall of human leaders is no random thing. God is in control of the entire process from beginning to end. Make no mistake. Verses 26, excuse me, 25 and 26. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Well, verse 25 follows the pattern of verse 18 by introducing a rhetorical question. The difference is that this time it is the Lord who was speaking instead of the prophet. God asked if there was anyone who would compare to him. The answer is understood. No one can compare to the Lord. No one. Interestingly, the title for God in this verse is the Holy One. This stands in contrast to the earlier title of El, in, which meant God in verse 18. The title Holy One of Israel was one of Isaiah's favorite terms for God. In this context, text, it marks God's morally perfect character and his separateness from his creation. Because God is the Holy One, He would deliver His people, and He desired that they emulate His own character in their behavior. There can be little doubt that Isaiah had in mind the vision of the angels crying, Holy, 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 in chapter 6, verse 3, as He declared the power of the Holy One. Just as verse 25 echoes verse 18, verse 26 echoes verses 19 and 20. While verses 19 through 20 speak of the process of creating idols, verse 26 points to God as creator of the host of heaven, namely the stars. This seemingly simple statement had a huge implication, had huge implications for Isaiah's audience. In most ancient Near Eastern religions, the heavens and the stars were thought to represent the gods. The pagan, this pagan belief that the sun, moon, and stars were, were gods to be worshipped rubbed off on the Israelites over time, unfortunately. For example, we see in 2 Kings 17, 16 that worship all the host of heaven. By contrast, Isaiah noted that God created the stars, numbered them, calling them all by name. To name something in the biblical culture was to have some measure of power over it. Even as God marked Abram and Jacob as his own by giving them new names of Abraham and Israel, you see that in Genesis 17, uh, verse 5, and Genesis 32, verse 28, so God has control over the stars of heaven. Their existence depends on God, and he controls each and every one of their number. Questions to consider at this time. Have you ever been in a situation in which you wondered if God was truly in control? Given the passage above, how can looking at the majesty of creation help you when you face a struggle in your future? Great questions to consider. 
Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 through 31. Verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Verse 29. He gives power to the faint, and to him who, who has no might, he increases strength. Verse 30. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. Verse 31. Very familiar. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Well, Jacob and Israel are different names for the same group, God's people. Here, God asks them why they continue to doubt. The phrasing suggests that they were not just doubting, but hurting, saying that their way was hidden from God. The situation was akin to the groaning of the people who were in bondage in Egypt. You see that in Exodus 2, verse 24. They thought that God was either blind to their suffering in the captivity or ignoring it. Israel stated that my God does not care about bringing justice to the cause of his people. They assumed their personal God had decided not to be faithful to the covenant he had made with them. Well, while God's people may have felt abandoned, nothing could have been further from the truth. In reference back to verse 21, God asked them, Have you not known? Or have you not heard? The implication of the repeated questions is that, is that they should have known that, and that they should have heard. They had no excuse. God had told them and proved to them that He is the Creator of all. He is everlasting. Because of these characteristics, God knows everything. No detail escapes Him. And, he, and this certainly included the situation of his people. He does not get distracted because he is weary or stop paying attention because he is faint. In fact, it is God who gives power to those who are faint or to him who has no might. God has an inexhaustible supply of power. As creator, he stands outside of creation and is not limited in the way created things are. How could God's people, even in exile, think he would abandon them or lose control for even one second? In verses 30 through 31, the prophet gave a response to the questions of verses 21 and 28. Even youths and young men, the pinnacle of human strength and vitality, are limited. They do tire. Obviously, this weariness contrasts with the unlimited strength of God described in the preceding verse. In contrast, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. This type of waiting implies trust. Herein is the irony of what is required. Young men will tire, but God will not. The message is that human strength will fail every time. The only sure strength is found in the God of the Bible. God's people must put aside their efforts to rescue themselves and wait for God's deliverance. To wait implies hope and expectation. Thus, it is not waiting without hope, but waiting with the full expectation that God will act. There may be a delay, but this should not be equated with a lack of power or concern on the part of God. When the people wait in hope and trust in God, they will find the strength they need, for it will come to them from God's limitless supply. They shall mount up, they shall run, they shall walk. Three modes of travel that all show forward movement. They may have different paces, but God's people will never be stuck. They have no reason to despair. Some questions to consider as we conclude. Can you think of a situation in which you tried everything you could think of to fix a problem and only then thought to pray about it? Based on the above verses, how should we go about dealing with difficult problems? Does waiting on the Lord mean we don't do anything but wait? Why or why not? Great questions to consider. Well, the key doctrine they want us to glean from the lesson today is the doctrine of God. And to God, we owe the highest love, reverence, and obedience. You find that referenced in 1 Timothy 1, 17. Well, this concludes our lesson for today. And I pray it's been beneficial and helpful to you and for you.
And I pray that the message of Isaiah will continue to seek deep down into our hearts. I pray you'll join us next week as we're we'll looking at chapter 46 in the book of Isaiah. And I pray you, you be able to be with us at that, that time. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you, God, that, Lord, you do strengthen us. Lord, you do undergird us. And we mount up as, with wings as eagles, God, when we trust you. And I pray we would completely, completely trust you in all, all situations and circumstances in our lives, just as Isaiah encourages us to do. And these things we ask in your name. Amen. Good to be with you this week. Look forward to seeing you for next week's lesson.